Christmas is next week, Monday. And I'm not ready, Elad. Now, I don't know about you, but there's something that, that, that really confuses me about me. Every year, there are things that fall on the same day. Every single year. My wife's birthday. It is on the same. It never changes. Every single year, it's on the same day. My anniversary. Every year, it's on the same day. Christmas. Every year, December 25th, but somehow, all three of these things seem to sneak up on me. I don't know how it happens. I come a week away, like a week out, and I'm not ready, and then I have a lot of stuff to do between today and next week, Monday. I have so much to do between today and next week, Monday, that I have no idea how I am going to get ready for this event. Now... Between now and next week, Monday, though, I have a lot of things to do. I have parties. Everybody has a party. You know, like there's your job. Your job has a party. And you have to go to all these parties. It's so much stress. You have to decide which ones to go to. And when me and my wife are driving to a party, I always ask her a question. And this is the question I ask. It's not because I'm antisocial, but this just helps me. So we're driving to the party and say we're getting there at 7. I say we're arriving at 7. What time are we leaving? And, and then she, she, good question, right? And then she says, will you stop asking me that question and just enjoy it? And I say I would enjoy it much more if I knew what time you were leaving. Now, the reason she doesn't like to answer that question is because she knows if she says nine, around nine o'clock, I'm going to be tapping her on her shoulder saying it's time to go. And she might not be ready to go. And then there's your parties, and then there's the stress of, you know, your gatherings. Who do you invite? You know, if I invite so-and-so and not so-and-so, are they going to be offended? If I, it's just so much stress. And then there is, you know, which relatives do you have over? Whose house do I go to on Christmas Day? So much stuff to do between now and then. So much stuff to think about. So much stuff to interpret. So much stuff to decide what to do. And then, there's a thing that all men, well, I want to speak for all men. All men that I know don't like at all. You got to buy gifts. Now, here's the problem with gifts. Like, let's say I'm buying a gift for, for, for Tainil. You know what I'm supposed to do? You know what people expect me to do? To find a gift that you always wanted but never got for yourself. Like, I'm supposed to pass you a gift and you go, Wow, this is what I always wanted. But this is what you always wanted. You would have probably got it sometime for yourself. But we put so much stress on ourselves that that's the type of gift we're looking for. And then, have you ever passed a gift to somebody, had them open it, and then give, given you the disappointed face? Have you ever had that happen to you? It's the worst thing in the world, especially if you put so much thought into your gift. One year, I, I, I put so much thought into my wife's gift. Like, this is the year that I put, like, a lot of thought. Like, I started early. I got the gift early. I wrapped it real neatly. And she opened it, and it was a dress. And she picked it up, and she looked at it, and she said... Thank you. <laughs> so one of the things that I'm really happy for now is that my wife helps me out big time. You know how she, what she does? Sometime like the week before Christmas or her birthday, she walks in and she said, I have the gift you bought for me. And I'm like, thank you very much. I love this system because I get it right every single year. But Christmas, we can make it so complicated. We can make it so complex. All of these things to think about what we're going to do about this, what we're going to do about that. And the thing is, sometimes with the very first Christmas, we can make it complicated as well. I, I listened to a thing a couple of weeks ago about theologians. De these are all Christians, but they're debating stuff around the virgin birth and around the first Christmas. And it was so complicated. I, f I finished listening to a group of, I think it was five people, talking about the birth of Jesus Christ, and at the end of it, I was exhausted. 
Sometimes we're not ready for Christmas because we can make it as complicated as this part of Christmas because we can make it as complicated as the other part of Christmas. And the other part of Christmas, to me, is exhausting. Now, what is the point of Christmas? Well, the point of Christmas is the same point of history. It is the same point of everything, and that is this, Jesus at the center. The point of Christmas is Jesus at the center. Jesus is the central theme uh, of history. He is the central theme of the universe. He is the central theme of our lives. Jesus is the center. He is preeminent. He is above all. He is before all. He is Lord. He is God. He is Jesus. And the simple message of Christmas is Jesus Christ at the center of everything. Now, when these theologians were discussing it, one of them said, doesn't that seem, they were discussing this, the, um, the birth of Jesus, and they were saying, doesn't sometimes, and this is a Christian guy, doesn't it seem like God is kind of self-absorbed, he's saying, because he wants to be worshipped all the time. He wants to be at the center all the time. Now, if this was a human, you know, if I was running around going, you worship me, I need to be at the center, you would say this about me, right? Isn't God self-absorbed? And I thought about this for a while, and this is what I came up with. Who's, what's the center of the universe? The sun. Now, there's a reason the sun is the center of our solar system. Sorry, I said universe, didn't I? There's a reason the sun is the center of our solar system. And the most kind, most loving thing that the sun could do is to always remain the center of our solar system. Because if the sun stops being the center of our solar system, every other planet has a problem. Now let's say the earth said, listen, you seem self-absorbed, sun. I want to be the center of the solar system. And then the earth took its place in there. Well, here's a problem. The earth is something like 30,000 times smaller than the sun, and it doesn't have the gravitational pull to hold all of this together. So if the earth decides to be the center, there is chaos. So the most loving thing that the sun could do is to remain in the center of our solar system because when it does, there is order. When it does, everything holds together. When it does, everything works the way that it should. And God is not self-absorbed because if the most loving thing that he can do is to make himself the center of everything. Because when he is not... There is chaos. When he is not, things do not hold together. When he is not, I have seen this in my own life, there is a mess. And when he is not, I often say, God, I please become the center again. So this is not self-absorbed. The most loving thing God could ever do, the most loving thing God could ever do is to make himself the center. Now, we're going to look at one verse which is the announcement of the angels to the shepherds about the very first Christmas. And we're going to look at two things with regard to Jesus being the center and being the first and biggest and best gift ever given. So, we're looking at today Jesus as a gift. When we consider gifts, we normally think of things like this. But this is the real gift. Before we look at this, we're going to look at some qualities of a gift. Okay? Here's the first quality of a gift. It has to be given voluntarily. Like I have to, if I have a gift and I want to give to somebody, in order for it to be a gift, I have to give it voluntarily. Secondly, there is no payment from the recipient. Because if I give a gift and I say, here, out of will, I want to give you this gift. Um, it is a brand new, what's something that out of will would love? A brand new, one of those wigs that the judges wear. <laughs> right? And it's a new style. This one's dyed several different colors. And I give it to him and I say, Out of will, here's a gift for you. Just give me $50 and it's yours. The minute that I say that, it ceases to be a gift, right? Now, do we have any basketball fans in the audience? Anybody like to watch or play basketball? Okay, come here, come here sir. Okay, I need you to stand right there. Now, I'm going to give you a gift, and this gift is going to go right along the lines of the things that you like to do. Right? Here we go. Watch these amazing skills. Oh, 
All right. What are you going to do with that? You want to give it back? No? Okay. <laughs> All right. So this is a gift. You can take it. It's yours. <laughs> now, it was given voluntarily. Or I'm not sure. It was I told him to make that pass? But it was given voluntarily. And the recipient made no payment at all. He didn't know he was getting this gift today. He just showed up. He was sitting in the audience. And now he has been blessed with something that he can use for something that he loves to do. Right? Third thing. All costs are assumed by the giver. And we'll talk about this more with regard to Jesus. But the, all the costs related to the gift are assumed by the giver. Okay, I was the giver of that gift. I went to M&M, not M&M, Sport to Us, because I don't think M&M sell basketballs. I went to Sport to Us on Friday, and I picked up that gift, and I gave them a piece of plastic, which they charged, right? <laughs> and then they gave it to me, so every single cost associated with that basketball, I assumed. Okay? All of the costs are assumed by the giver. And then, there has to be a transfer of property of property or interest from one individual to another. That means something is given or there's interest in something. For instance, I might say to my daughter, here's a gift. This is um, our house and I'm going to give it, I'm going to transfer the interest in this property to you, okay? Now, who's a football fan? Oh, come here, sir. Hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. What team do you support? Chelsea, Chelsea go back, go back. I, I'm just joking, I'm just joking, I'm just joking. All right, stand over there, stand over there. All right, watch these amazing skills, come on. Oh, he, he was juggling it, but you never saw it. Oh, oh, oh! Oh! All right, let's... Great job. All right. So, would you like that? Yeah. <laughs> you want to give it back? No? You're going to take it? All right. You can have it. So, there was a transfer of something. There was something that was in his hands. Aren't they brothers? There was a transfer of something. <laughs> That was in his hands, it left his hands, and then it went to his hands. So now, it has left the giver, and it is going to the recipient. Okay? So these are the, are the properties of a gift, and we're going to talk about that with regard to Jesus. Now, here's the verse. Luke 2, 11. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior which is Christ the Lord. This is the angel showing up to the shepherds, telling them that you will, on the very first Christmas, receive a gift. And then he describes the gift. And here's what the two things that we're going to look at with regard to this gift. The gift, first of all, is a Savior. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. God gave us a gift, and he is a Savior. Now, one of the things that I think that we do not do enough in our Christian experience is to consider Jesus as Savior. Because we consider him as Savior the day we get saved, you know. We think of who he is because on that day we understand that we need to be saved from something. We understand that we need uh, someone to save us because we can't save ourselves. We accept Jesus Christ as personal Savior and on that day we consider him as Savior. But something happens to us as we begin our Christian experience. We begin to forget that Jesus was our Savior. We might speak it, but we don't think about it. We don't consider it. We don't internalize it. And we always need to remember that the very first gift that was given was Jesus as Savior. What is a Savior? Now, let's think about some times when people need to be saved. I've only seen this once. I was in... Never say you were in if you can't remember where you were. I was in another country. <laughs> and we were on the beach. 
And then there was a person who was drowning. She was, she was out far. She was yelling. A guy came from the life, life thing, and he had that little plastic thing. He jumped in the water. He went and got her. This woman needed to be saved. And this woman understood that she could not save herself. She needed somebody to save her from what was imminent and then bring her to safety. And this guy swam out there. He got her, and he brought her back. And I will never, re never forget how impressed I was with how this guy conducted himself and how he saved this woman. Sometimes we need uh, saving financially. We might be in a position where we are in debt and we cannot get out, and then somebody comes alongside and they help us out, they give us some funds, and all of a sudden we are saved from our situation. And now we are in a new place because of what this person decided to do. On the very first Christmas... The gift that we were given was a savior. Now, let's go back. Let's go back and look at these. Now, consider this. There are times where we get overwhelmed when somebody gives us a gift. Because maybe of how expensive it is, maybe because of the thought that went in it. Sometimes when you get a gift, you can look at it and see that this person considered you. One time... A long time ago in the marriage ministry, we had um, a dinner at the aquarium. And, and I told the men, the women ate, the men served them, the men cooked, we did everything. But I told them they had to get a gift, and the gift had to be cheap. This sounds terrible, but let me keep going. However, when they gave the gift to the wife, they had to be able to tell a story. They had to say, I got you this because remember when we were, right? So all around the aquarium, here's what I heard. I heard men going to the wives and saying, I got this because, and then they tell the story. And I heard women going, <gasps> because the fact that their husband put that much thought into a gift probably shocked them first. <laughs> but secondly, they were overwhelmed by it. Because somebody thought so hard about something that they wanted to give to them. And it blessed these women so much that guys, I, re I remember the day, the week before we were having it, like, because what happened was the guys dressed up and drove around and picked, picked all the wives up and we, um, we brought them to the aquarium and then we served them and then we took care of them and all of that stuff. And a lot of the guys before that day were like, Pastor Hamsley, why can't we just sit and eat with them? And why can't we, this seems like too much work. A lot of the guys two weeks later were saying, thank you. Thank you, I can't believe this. We took, I took her, my wife, and then I said to her, a week later, I'm going to go play golf. And she said, sure. <laughs> she never says sure. She always complains. But here's what happened. There was a group of women that were overwhelmed by the thought that went into this gift. I want you to think about the gift that we received the first Christmas day. He was a savior. How much thought from our God went into this gift. This was what we needed. This was what we couldn't do for ourselves. This was a God who considered us in eternity past and said, here is what you need. And then gave us the perfect gift. Now, and it was given voluntarily. Jesus Christ, in order to be our Savior, had to live a sinless life and then go to a cross on behalf of us where he had every single sin that we would ever commit heaped on him. And he did it all voluntarily. There's no payment from the recipient. Here's the awesome thing about God. He says, receive my free gift of salvation. And then even after you are saved, he says, you don't have to do anything to keep it. I just want you to do something to demonstrate to me that you have it. You don't live now in order to keep this gift. You live in order to demonstrate that you have it. There is absolutely no payment made before or after by the recipient. It is a free gift of God and it is a Savior who is Christ our Lord. All costs are assumed by the giver. Every single cost that was necessary for you and I to receive this gift was borne by Jesus Christ that day. So that none, now here's the awesome thing, so that none of us would have to pay the penalty for our sin, the thing that we deserve to do. 
He did what he, he, he did what he didn't deserve to do so that you and I could live in a manner in which we never ever deserved. He is a gift and he is a savior. And then listen to this. The transfer of property or interest. You know what the transfer was on that day? All of our sin was heaped on him. And then when we accept Jesus Christ, the righteousness of God is given to us freely. What a transfer. What a transfer. No payment. I am given it freely. By a savior who died the most horrible death on my behalf so I would not have to. What a gift. What a gift. Don't complicate Christmas. You know what happened on Christmas? You were given a gift and he is a savior. Now, now, here's what it says next. God gave us a gift and he is our Lord. He's not just our savior. Now listen, in order for him to be your savior, you have to acknowledge that you are weak. You have to acknowledge that you can't save yourself. And can I tell you something? Acknowledging those things is not weakness, it's strength. But he is also our Lord. So here is the gift that we were given. We were given a savior. And we were given our, our Lord. And you know what this means? This means access to his guidance. It means access to his wisdom. It means access to his knowledge. He doesn't save us and leave us alone. Now, the issue with this is control. Who is in control? Who is in charge? If I have this issue with my six-year-old daughter, okay? She wants to be in control of everything. She wants to be in control of her diet. Um, and I probably need somebody to be in control of mine as well. However, <laughs> I pick her up at school and the first thing she asks is, can I have some candy? Now she knows, this is the thing about her. She knows that there's one, in, in our household, there's one time you can have candy, that's Saturday and you can have some. But every single day, she tries to wield control by asking, can she have some candy? Well, I, every day. And I say, but you know you can't have any today. And she says, can I see my iPad? iPad is for weekends, only for weekends. You know that, right? So she wants to be in control. Now, here is the silly thing about this, this whole, in, this whole interaction with me and her. She's not qualified to be in control. She's six. She doesn't understand that if she eats candy all day, her teeth will fall out by the time she's 12. And she doesn't understand that if she watches the iPad every day, all day, that her mind is going to be polluted with all of this stuff. She doesn't understand. And I look at her and sometimes I get insulted. And look, why would you want to be in charge when you have such a knowledgeable, wise father? <laughs> I know what you need. Why would we want to be in charge when we have such a knowledgeable, wise father? <laughs> Who knows what we need and says, the second part of the gift is, I want to be your Lord. I want to be. I want to be the one in charge. I want to be the one in control in your life because I know much better than you even what you need. I know much better than you. Here's the thing you say you want. You say you want to be conformed in the image of Christ? Well, who do you think knows what you need in your life in order for you to be conformed to the image of Christ? You or me. Matter of fact, a lot of times when you ask me for something, you are trying to avoid things that I want you to go through to conform you to the image of Christ. And then you get in that thing, which I need you in to conform to the image of Christ, and you complain to me. Because you're not in control. But I am. And the reason you are in there is because I am doing something in your life to make you into what I desire to see you become. He is our Lord. I used this as an example in prayer meeting not too long ago, but it's like we're driving along Harbor Road, and I know buses aren't allowed on Harbor Road, but we're behind a bus, right? And Harbor Road is windy, and you can't see what's coming, right? But in the air over the harbor is a helicopter, and you have a radio connection to that helicopter, and that helicopter is going... Listen, uh, don't go yet because 
right around that corner, there's a car coming. Now, this helicopter can see what's coming and is giving you information to keep you safe, right? And the helicopter goes, don't go. And here's what, wouldn't you be really silly if you said, I don't care what you say I'm going. Based on what I feel like, I'm going. You pass it, boss, you get in an accident. You know why? Because there was somebody with much more vision, much more knowledge, much more wisdom than you will ever have who was trying to tell you what to do in order that you could traverse around the bus and be safe. And you decided, I want to be Lord. The gift was a savior, but it was also a Lord. And Lordship, to me, is the most serious issue in the Christian experience after you get saved. Will Jesus Christ be Lord? That to me determines so many things. Every time that I don't allow Jesus to be Lord, sin soon follows. And when sin follows, if I don't go back and allow Jesus to be Lord, then sin entraps me. Every time I don't allow Jesus to be Lord, I miss opportunities where he desires me to do something for his glory. I miss opportunities to be in a situation where he desires me to be in so I can grow for his glory. I miss heaven's best for my life. Why would I want to be in control when I can allow heaven to be in control? That way I can have heaven's results. I can have heaven's experiences and not mine. So the very first Christmas... We were given a gift, and that gift was Jesus, and he is a Savior, and he is a Lord. Now, here's, here's what it's like to have Jesus as Lord. Do you remember, um, who remembers growing up, uh, and um, there used to be people who knocked on your door, and they tried to sell you Encyclopedia Britannicas. You remember those things? You know what it is? Yeah. And you would put them in a, in a bookcase, and it would start with A, and it would say A to whatever, and then at the end it would be like whatever to Z. So they would come, and they would sell you these things with all sorts of knowledge, right? Well, I remember after we purchased the Encyclopedia Britannica, everything I did in school got much better. Because there was a knowledge in these things that, was, that I didn't have. It, I would read them, and I would learn stuff that I didn't know. Right now we have... Um, do you realize you can find out today, you don't need an Encyclopedia Britannica, but you can find out anything you want at any time? Like, honestly, we'll be home, and we're watching TV, and, you know, clearly, we're probably watching Everton, who are doing much better. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. <laughs> so anyway, so we'll be watching Everton play, and my wife will go, who's that guy? And I'll be like, well, that's, um, you know, I tell her who the guy is. And then she wants to find out some information about him or something about his wife, and she just Googles, and there it is. The answer's right there. Like, it's unbelievable. So we have knowledge at our fingertips, right? This is what it's like to have Jesus as Lord. Now, imagine having knowledge at your fingertips, being asked a question that you don't know the answer to, but you decide to answer without consulting the knowledge. You could go and Google it and get the exact answer and have the correct answer. And here's what happens, I believe, in our, in our life. I know it happens in my life. Oftentimes, I am, my life poses me a question which I answer before going to my Lord. Which means that I have the very same issue as my daughter. I want to wrestle control from somebody who knows what's better for me than I do. And this is an issue in our lives. Making Jesus as a Lord of every single thing is a difficult thing. Because there are some times in my life where Jesus is not Lord of a certain area, and I don't even, either I don't know or I have deceived myself into thinking that he is. You know what I mean? And there are some times when Jesus is not Lord of our lives in specific areas, and we know. Like we know. The things that we are doing, the things that we are saying demonstrate to us that Jesus is not Lord. But for some reason, we are not ready to allow him to be Lord. Now, I want you to understand something with regard to lordship, okay? 
It was part of the gift on the very first Christmas. Jesus Christ wants to be Lord. He wants to be your Lord. He wants to guide you. He wants to give you wisdom. He wants to give you knowledge. It is part of the gift. So you know what we need to do with regard to Savior and Lord? We need to do just what these two guys did. We need to stand before Jesus or fall before Jesus and have everything that we saw with regard to a transfer of one thing from one person to another and say, God, I don't want to be Lord anymore. I am giving this over to you, and I desire you to be Lord of my life. Every area, Lord, please be Lord of my life. And demonstrate to me where I am still holding on tight, where I am still grasping. There was a story I heard once where there was a guy who was, he was being, you know, he was being witness to, and he refused to except Jesus Christ, and he just kept saying, I can't let go, I can't let go. And this is a true story. So that same guy was in his house one day, and he heard, he heard um, somebody yelling and screaming and crying. And so he leaves his house, and he goes, and he sees a little boy on his roof, and the little boy's holding onto, his ch- onto the chimney. So what happened, the little boy climbed the ladder, he got to the top, he was holding on, he looked down, and he got scared, and he, he just, just paralyzed. So the man yells to him, hey, just come down, the ladder's right there. And the little boy said, I can't let go. I can't let go. I'm too scared. So then the man climbs up the, the ladder, gets on the um, roof, and he looks at the little boy and he says, come with me. I'll take you down. He said, I can't let go. I can't let go. I can't let go. And then the man finally got to him, hugged him, and said, I won't let you go. We're coming down together. And he went down, and he brought the little boy to safety. And then he looked at the little boy, and the little boy was shaking and crying, And he realized that day that what he was doing to God was the same thing that little boy was doing. This man was holding on to stuff, and he did not want to let go. And God broke his heart that day, and he let go. He let go. And by letting go, he said, Jesus, I want you to be my Savior and my Lord. Being ready for Christmas means you are ready to receive God's gift. If you need to receive him as Savior, then that's what you are ready to receive. And if you need to receive him as Lord, then that's what you need to receive. Jesus is a gift given to all, but he doesn't become your personal gift until you make him your Savior and allow him to be your Lord. He is the center of the Bible and the center of the universe, but he is Jesus and wants to be the center of your life. Isaiah 43, 11, I, even I, am the Lord, and apart from me, there is no Savior. He is Lord and He is Savior. If you could save yourself, then you could be the center. If you were qualified to be your Lord, then you could be the center. But there is only one person who is able to save every single person from what is necessary for them to be saved from. And there is only one person qualified to be Lord, and that's Jesus. Can we stand together? And let's pray. Father, I thank you today for the gift that you gave us on that first Christmas. Thank you, God, for the fact that Jesus desired to be our Savior, and He now even today desires to be our Lord. Lord, I pray You would speak to our hearts for those of us who have not accepted You as personal Savior. Today we would let go and allow You to be our Savior. And for those of us who are holding on pieces of our lives in which we are not allowing You to be the Lord, we would let go and allow You to be Lord of our lives. Father, I pray this song is not just something we would sing, but something we would live, and that is Jesus at the center of it all. If you are here and you have never asked Jesus to be your Savior, then He's not the center of your life. He still loves you. He still has plans for you. But the first plan is for you to receive the gift of Jesus. And so if you're here today and you have never asked Jesus to be your Savior, it's as simple as A, B, and C. A is to admit that you have sinned before a holy God. B is to believe that Jesus came, 
grew up, died on the cross to pay the debt for the sin that you and I owed. And C is to call on God to save you from your sins. So if you're here and you've never asked Jesus to be your Savior, I'm going to lead you in a simple and short prayer. All eyes are closed. This isn't a prayer for me or to satisfy anyone else in here. It's between your heart and daddy's heart. And I want you to pray this. If that's you, just repeat after me. Dear God, I admit that I have sinned before you. And I recognize that I need to be saved. And I believe that you, Jesus, loved me enough to die on the cross to pay the penalty for the sin that I owe. And I call on you now to be my Savior and my Lord. Save me now. If you're here and you prayed that prayer, all eyes are closed, would you just raise your hand just real quick anywhere from here on the balcony? If you prayed, if you prayed that prayer, would you just slip your hand up real quick? No hands went up, but that's a blessing as well because I'm going to make an, an assumption that we're here and we know Jesus as our Savior. And so as we were reminded this morning, it's one thing to be saved. It's one thing to be rescued, but it's another thing altogether for Jesus to be the Lord of our lives. And so I want us to raise our hand right now. We're just going to pray and ask Jesus to be the Lord of our lives. In our pain, we're going to ask Jesus to be the Lord of our lives. In our disappointment, we're going to ask Jesus to be the Lord of our lives. Father, we bless you, God, because you are God, and you will always be God. Jesus, you are the center of it all. Right now in heaven, you have designated angels singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. And that's never going to change, God because you're receiving the glory that is due you, because you are the center of it all. But Father, there are times in our lives, God, that we still want to wrestle that control away from you so that we can do our own thing in our own way and in our own time, God. And if we're honest, God, that never amounts to anything, God, because when we're in control, we make a mess, God. So Father, I'm asking that you would help us, God, by your Spirit, to let you be in control of our lives, dear God, because you know what's best. You love us beyond that which we can ever imagine, God, and you have a plan for each and every one of us, God. So when we're tempted, God, would you help us to remember that you see what we can't see, God. You have resources that we can't even imagine, God. So God, would you be the Lord of our lives, God? Come on, just ask him right now. God, be the Lord of my life. Come on, from your heart to daddy's heart, just tell him that God, be the Lord of my life. Go ahead. Ask him that right now. Tell him that. Tell him that. He loves when his people are humble and they recognize our need for him. So just tell him, God, be the Lord of my life. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, God. We bless you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, we can give God a hand clap of praise. And thank you, God, for your grace, God. Thank you for your mercy, God. Thank you for the second chance, the third chance, the fourth chance, the fifth chance, God. Your grace just keeps coming on and on, God. Your compassion is new towards us every single morning. Great is your faithfulness towards us, God. And you're faithful, God, to help us to realign our lives with you, God, so that we can give you what you deserve and receive from you what we desperately need, God. So, Father, as we go into this Christmas season, God, as we look forward to celebrating your best gift to us, God. Help us not to get wrapped up in the tinsel and the gifts, God. And thank you that we have means to encourage each other like that. Thank you for that, God. But God, you're the center of it all, God. And so if we go through Christmas and we don't realign our lives and say, God, be the Lord of our lives, we're missed it, God. Help us not to miss you this year, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. This message has been brought to you by Cornerstone Bible Fellowship Bermuda. To connect with us, visit us at www.cornerstone.bm or if you have a prayer request, 
email us at prayer at cornerstone.bm.